it's difficult to make the case against the Fed at a time when people don't understand the principles behind price gouging. People don't understand the principles, the economic principles, that say price gouging is okay, but the economic principles about anything, about price controls, about rent control, about immigration, about tariffs. I mean, one of the things that is should be obvious from following this show, from listening to the Iran Book Show anyway, one of the things that should be absolutely obvious is just how thoroughly, unbelievably ignorant people are about economics. And even when they're not ignorant about it, the extent to which they act is ignorant. That is, to the extent to which they ignore economics. They ignore the science, they ignore the data, they ignore the facts, they ignore reality. I mean, it's one of these unique fields in, in, in human life where we really do know a lot. You can call economics a dismal science, but the reality is we understand and know a lot about economics. We know how the economy works in big picture. We, you know. Given that we can't search all the planet, we don't know the minutia, and don't need to know the minutia, but we know. We know some pretty important principles that apply to economics. Laws of supply and demand that affect, for example, cost gouging. We know these things, and we can even, with a little bit of thought, we can understand the second level and third level effects of economics. It's not a baby science. It's a full-blown science of, of human action. It's a science of human trade, of production. And it's, it, it doesn't mean it's not without flaws. It doesn't mean there's not a lot yet to be discovered. It doesn't mean that we know everything. But we know a lot, a lot of economic stuff. The problem is that you can't apply all this stuff that we know to the economy in a sense of, I can't say, oh, okay, I've studied economics, I know economics, so now I can run the economy. That, that's exactly the opposite of what knowing economics teaches you, is that you cannot run the economy. Or, I know economics, I've studied economics, I know it all, I can predict where the stock market is heading tomorrow. Of course you can't. And if you understood economics, and if you knew economics, you would know that you can't. That is knowledge that comes out of the study of economics. Economics teaches you what you can and cannot do, what is possible and what is not possible, what is metaphysically impossible, in spite of your wishes and your desires. It is a science, a very well-developed science with a lot of really interesting principles. Now, again, it cannot predict what will happen every time the government sneezes in a complex economy because it's complex. And because the complexity involves human action, which means human choices and human decisions. And you can't predict those, certainly not with certainty. And, not, and aggregating those decisions doesn't make any sense. So part of knowing the science of economics is to know its limitations. That is, to know not its limitations qua science, but its limitations qua what is the relevant field of study. And economics as a science is not supposed to tell you what interest rates should be. Because what interest rates should be, economics tells you, is whatever the market determines them to be at the intersection of the supply and demand for particular loanable funds. That's what economics tells you. It doesn't, the, the, the theories that we have, the Keynesian macroeconomic theories, are not economics. They're pretend, extrapolations from some local knowledge of economics, microeconomics, to assume that we can somehow run the entire economy based on that knowledge, and we can't. 
And that's why we get these problems with the Fed. That's why, you know, uh, the Fed has all these models. The Fed has all this knowledge. I mean, the Fed, you know, does it get it right? Does it get it wrong? Is meaningless because there is no right or wrong. There is no answer to that question because the market is not allowed to function. Even the question of does the Fed's particular actions do more harm than good, we don't know because we don't have a counterfactual. We don't know what the alternative could be, would be. If the Fed had decreased interest rates three months ago versus if the Fed increases in two weeks, do we really know what the difference would be? No, we can't. Complexity is too high. And it's dependent on human behavior, which is dependent on human choices, which cannot, by definition, be predicted. So economics is a real science, misused, abused on a massive scale. Why? And why does nobody take the science of economics seriously, right? Why don't people pay attention to even the things that all economists agree about? Like all economists, 95%, because I think I saw a graph where 5% disagree. 95% of economists, this is like the global warming stuff, 99% of scientists, but 95% of economists understand the damage rent control does. And it doesn't matter. Cities will continue to do it. Politicians will ignore it. Individuals will advocate for it. Voters will vote it in. I think 95% of economists understand the horrific damage which we explained yesterday that price gouging does. And yet, it doesn't matter. Every state in the union has a price gouging law. Law. Companies have been sued based on that law for raising prices during so-called emergencies. And there was an article today in The Atlantic that this is the title, right? Sometimes you just have to ignore the economics. Kamala Harris's proposed price gouging ban might irritate academics but it makes sense to everyone else. Why does it make sense to everyone else? Why? What makes it make sense when it clearly is a violation of the principles of economics? It's a violation of our understanding of how markets actually work, how the economy actually works. What makes these uh, anti-economics ideas hold sway. I mean, 95% of economists understand the damage of tariffs. Go try to persuade somebody in MAGA. Try to persuade somebody, a, a Trump supporter the tariffs are bad. You just can't. Can't get through to them. They will support it no matter what. Most economists, I don't know if 95%, but certainly a large percentage of economists, over 50%, understand the damage minimum wages do to the people that are supposed to help, to the poorest among us. Does it make any difference? Most economists understand the benefits of immigration, even mass immigration, to the economy at least. Does it make any difference? Does it sway anybody? I mean, and I'm not talking about does it sway the other, but they'll still make the economic arguments against immigration, even though there are no economic arguments against immigration. And it just goes on and on. You can take it issue after issue after issue. Uh, and, and Europe and the United States and China and everybody, 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 everybody ignores economics, ignores the principles, ignores the true ideas that are embedded in economics. And the question is, at the end of the day, why? 
Now, they will create massive rationalizations for why. They will tell you just so stories about how price gouging in this place, you know, made it impossible for somebody in a wheelchair to get to the hospital to get his dialysis done because he couldn't afford to pay the excess gasoline. They can go on and on and on giving you made up examples of just so stories of why it doesn't work. But, and they have to do that because they know that it does work. The price gouging does everything I said it does yesterday, that it benefits. It's a dramatic benefit to people. And of course, it's rights respecting. You don't have a right to get gasoline at a particular price. You don't have a right to get a hotel room at a particular price. It's whatever they want. And they're not bad for doing it. They're trying to make a living. And by trying to make a living and raising prices, they're actually increasing efficiency. They're actually improving things. Anyway, they'll rationalize it through complexity. They'll create complex scenarios where it seems like it all breaks down, but usually all that means is they're ignoring a bunch of stuff. They're not talking about a bunch of stuff that is relevant. They're just pretending it doesn't exist. And this is common. This is on the left and on the right and on the center and everybody, because the one thing that you know in the world in which we live is that economic liberty is disrespected, economic liberty nobody cares about, is nobody's interested in. And nobody's interested in it, they rationalize because it doesn't work, they tell us. And they have a million reasons why it doesn't work. For tariffs, they'll just, they'll just mouth out some national security thing or they'll mouth, it, which is a ra complete rationalization, or they'll say, you know, we have to, it's the only way to bring back jobs back, even though the evidence is zero that they come back, or they'll, they'll play to some intuition, or the Chinese are subsidizing their businesses, so that's not fair, and that kind of creates, yeah, what about that, huh, how do I deal with that on top of all the, so introduce complexity and bamboozle the audience, but, but the complexity is being introduced into their own minds, it's not, they're not doing it on purpose to bamboozle the audience, they're, they're bamboozling themselves first. What's going on? Why is this so hard? And why do economists have such a hard time convincing people of the truth of what they're arguing? Again, this shouldn't be that hard. These principles, like what we talked about, price gouging last time, or minimum wage laws, easy supply and demand. It's, it's really not that difficult to get across. What's... Why can't they? And why is it dominated by the bad economists? So there's the obvious incentive that politicians have that um, in a free market, they lose a lot of their power. So there's no question the politicians, we understand their incentives. Politicians have no interest in understanding economics. They don't want to know. They don't want to understand. Because every time they dig in to understand something, every time they dig into understanding something, they, what they discover is that it will reduce the power that they have. That once you get economics, you understand how little politicians can do about it in a positive sense, and that all they can do is harm it, and that they should just stay out of it. Let markets work. Politicians don't want that. They don't want to hear that. Nobody spent their whole life engaged in political activism or engaged in getting to a position of power in order to not have power. They've spent their lives trying to gain power so they can execute power, which means control over other people's lives power over other people's livelihood. That's what they want. That's what they desire. That's what they strive for. And that's what they achieve. So politics is not about economics. Economics has no relevance to politics, except in the sense that 
they don't want to fail so badly as to be blamed for the failure and then for the power be taken away from them through an election. So they want to, they, they, they generally don't want to rock the boat too much in, in any direction because they want to make sure that they have plausible deniability, that they can, you know, pretend that everything is fine, they didn't do anything wrong, it's not their fault if anything goes bad. But they have no interest in economic liberalization, no interest in economic freedom, no interest in actually improving your quality of life and standard of living. There's just no interest in that. Particularly if we don't vote it. Now, why don't we vote it? Why don't we demand it? So here's the interesting thing. I think there are two issues going on here. One is people are genuinely ignorant of economics. And it's very easy to the people in power to bamboozle them, to confuse them. And the intellectuals, the economists trying to explain this come across as detached and come across as uncaring and come across as they probably don't have very good ways to explain the issues. But here I think is, is the key thing that politicians understand um, and, and it really moves the public. I've said this many times in my lectures and my talks. And my, people don't vote their pocketbook. They vote what they think is right, what they think is just. So I'll give you an example. When it comes to this price gouging thing, for example, I told you there's this article today in the Atlantic magazine. Sometimes you just have to ignore economics. Kamala Harris's proposed price gouging ban might irritate academics, but it makes sense to everyone else. What kind of sense does it make to everybody else? Well, here's the key paragraph in my view. Now, in, in the article, he does all the rationalizations. Oh, it does this, and these people suffer, and this, it doesn't really work because there's not perfect competition, and there's noise, and all, all these rationalizations about how complex the world is and we economists just don't understand. But at the end of the day, here is his argument. Here is his argument, because it's not just ignorance. This is another way, I'm reading for the article, this is another way of saying that price gouging bans are a form of moral, moral, ethical policy. The law recognizes that consumers not being the coldly rational homo economicus of academic models are going to be less price sensitive during disasters. Their desperation can be exploited. And people who lack the savings to get through a crisis or the resources to, co uh, to comparison shop are even more likely to suffer for price increases on essential items. In a pandemic, war, or major weather event, it seems morally repugnant to give an unearned bonanza to a big firm while denying essential services to valuable members of society. Vulnerable, sorry, vulner vulnerable members of society. All parents not just the wealthiest, should have an equal chance to obtain diapers, diapers, even if supply chains are disrupted. Price gouging law represent a different set of market rules grounded in fairness. And this is the bottom line, right? Uh, uh, it's all about morality. It's all about what you consider fair. It's all about ethics. It's not about economics. I remember once reading, this is years and years ago, there was a big discussion in the 2000s, I think, about CEO pay at the time. And Robert Reich, who, was, who had been Labor Secretary under Clinton, uh, wrote an op-ed. Robert Reich is still out there. You can find him. He hates Ayn Rand. Uh, uh, I think he's blocked me because in, on Twitter because he knows I'm affiliated. Anyway, Robert Weiss wrote this op-ed, and in the op-ed, he spent three quarters of the op-ed explaining in perfectly good economic terms why it made complete and utter sense to pay CEOs the kind of amounts that companies were paying them. And then he said, yeah, but 
it's morally repugnant to have CEOs making so much money when the employees on the shop floor make this little money. It's morally offensive. In other words, people like Robert Reich, and I think, I think most of the intellectuals in our world, these are the people who actually influence our culture, understand that economics is on the side of free markets. They understand that from a purely economic perspective, yeah, let markets rip. But what prevents them from advocating for that, whether honestly or just as the way to manipulate people, is that it's inconsistent with their altruistic, their egalitarian sense of morality. Somebody will suffer. Not everybody's being treated the same. That offends them. And they understand that the American public, unfortunately, is very sensitive to these issues of so-called fairness, morality. And because we've all been raised by good altruistic intellectuals since we were very little. So nobody wants to know the economics. Nobody cares about the economics because Real economics would lead us to a free market, which for them is almost by definition unfair, unequitable, immoral. For them what matters is morality. For them what matters is good versus evil. They're right. What matters in life is not efficiency. What matters in life is good versus evil. What matters in life is morality. What matters in life is fairness. Properly understood, right? So, uh, this is why people are ignorant of economics. They're not ignorant of economics because they haven't studied economics. They're not ignorant of economics because the economists are not explaining it. They're not ignorant of economics because the textbooks are lousy, although some of them are very lousy. They're ignorant of economics because they don't want the economics to be true. They understand that the, if the economics are true, they challenge their morality. People will not all be equal under, uh, in a free market if the economics are allowed to work. They won't all be equal. Some people will take a hit for a while, even if long-term they're far better off living in a free market. They might take a hit in the short run when they can't afford that gas to get to, get to work. So they understand, I think all of these understand, that fundamentally markets Economics, economic principles, as Adam Smith understood, are driven by selfish human behavior, self-interested human behavior, even greedy human behavior. And they have declared all of that to be immoral, fundamentally immoral. To be selfish is to be immoral. To be self-interested is to be immoral. To be greedy is to be immoral. Therefore, when you say, you know, companies can raise prices during a, a, some kind of spike in demand, well, they're just being self-interested. Yes, they are, by raising prices. And now, by definition, is immoral. So therefore, it's immoral. Therefore, it's bad. Now I have to find the economic explanation for why I don't like it. But it's bad. Notice, too, the trick he does here. I mean, I love this, right? Um, he says, it, is, it seems morally repugnant to give an unearned bonanza to a big firm while denying essential services, whatever. What about the little firms? What if the mom and top store on the local corner gouges? Uh, can they get away with it? 
will state laws and Kamala Harris's law not apply to them? Of course they do. They apply to all companies. They're not, you know, he couches it in terms of big firms because he knows he'll get the sympathy of Americans. Because those greedy bastards, those self-interested big firms. How much sympathy do any of these people have when the big firm loses business or when the crisis is such or the change in demand patterns and stuff is such where they have to where they lose money you know when oil prices go below the cost of production does anybody say huh those poor oil companies they're losing money right now and yet they're still pumping oil out to to, to provide it to us at a loss isn't that isn't that you know, something should be done to help them out. Well, of course not. And we all know that there are periods in which all companies and other companies lose money for, for stretches of time. And yet they're not allowed to make money when the market shifts on them and suddenly benefits them. Then it's windfall profits and we need to tax it or it's gouging and we need to ban it. It's interesting also, that in the beginning of this article, he says, you know, price gouging is when a natural disaster happens or some emergency, some big thing. He says natural disaster, short-term demand, you know, during an emergency, right? Where such a short, natural disaster, short demand, demand cannot be met by short-term supply, setting the stage for sellers to exploit their positions. And then in the paragraph after the one I just read to you, he says, Price gouging laws also protect against volatility and instability. During the immediate aftermath of COVID, unchecked price increases made an already bad inflation problem even worse, contributing to a dangerous spiral that harmed the macro economy as well as individual consumers. Really? How do you know? If the price increases were checked or unchecked. Who gets to decide? There's no shock here. You know, the, the, the increased demand is not a consequence of natural disaster. It's not a consequence of some shock to the system. It's a consequence of the government printing extra money. Prices go up because there's more demand from the public that's received more money from the government for doing nothing. So, Price gouging made an already bad inflation problem even worse. Show me one economic study that shows that. Show me one proof of that, that anybody could get away with that. Now, it is true that during certain periods of inflation, companies can raise prices in a way that increases their profits for a while. Yes, because they don't know how big inflation is going to be in the future. They defensively increase prices in anticipation of the inflation coming. And they might increase beyond that. And ultimately, they might have to lower prices in order to take into account that the inflation that they expected didn't happen. But when they lower prices, do they get any credit for that? Of course not. So, God, I mean, this is all about morality. This is none of this is economic. And they will lie and distort and misrepresent and, and use words like bonanza to a big firm in order to get you all riled up because the big business is stealing money from the little guy. What's morally repugnant is their morality. The morality that says that we should sacrifice our own interests for the interests of others. The morality that says that the standard for us should not be our own well-being, should not be our own profit in the economic sense, but other people. And of course, all the economic negative consequences that that exact position, that not seeking to profit maximize, brings about. By the way, uh, the guy in the wheelchair who has to have a dialysis at the hospital and who can't get there because of how many people in his local community would be happy to chip in a few bucks in order to buy him some gasoline? How many gasoline store owners would be willing to say, okay, you know what, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll give you some for free 
as they're gouging everybody else. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's just the whole thing is couched as you need a sacrifice as a producer, as somebody who's actually making this product available during this time of crisis, because they might someplace, somewhere in some universe be an individual who might suffer because of what you're doing. And it, it's, of course, not because of what he's doing. They, they will suffer because the hurricane came. They would suffer because war broke out. They will suffer because whatever the macro, whatever the big emergency event happened is. They're not because you have increased your price. And, of course, by increasing prices, as we saw yesterday, there are massive benefits to people like John Cochran's family who could find a hotel room when they were desperate for one, they couldn't have found it if they hadn't been price gouging going on. All right, so this is just all to point out, as I have in many of my talks, as I keep doing, that the issues we face about economic liberty have nothing to do with economics. It's not like over the last 10 years, the American people and American politicians and American intellectuals have lost their knowledge of economics. And all across the political spectrum, from the far left to the far right and everybody in between, have adopted, I don't know, some form of statist economic policy because they understand that that's better. You know, take Republicans. Republicans used to have some general vague notion that markets work. That's gone out the window. Why has it gone out the window? Is it gone out the window because the economic understanding has changed? No. Is it gone out the window because the new generation of Republicans are economically ignorant? New generation of, econo of, of Republican intellectuals? No. It's gone out the window because... It's not useful because it doesn't get them what they want. It's in opposition to the moral claims they want to make about the evil of importing stuff from Canada and China and Mexico and Europe and everybody else. The, the idea of you know, some kind of romantic, bogus idea of self-sufficiency. That's what they're really after. The, the economics of it, you know, they all know that it has to lower quality of life and standard of living. They all know that immigration benefits the economy. The studies on this are unequivocal. It doesn't matter. It's, it's wrong to bring in immigrants. It's wrong because they bring in their culture. It's wrong because they might actually replace some American jobs. They might, yeah. Face, Americans might face competition. God. Competition. We hate competition. Uh, so it's for cultural, political, moral reasons they don't want the immigrants. Nothing to do with economics. And, and you could find everybody makes the excuse, but welfare, but this, but that. And you show them the numbers, it doesn't change their mind. It never does. People don't want the minimum wage because they have an understanding of the benefits. It, it feels good. It seems like the right thing to do. It seems like the moral thing to do, helping those people out. Nobody should get paid seven bucks an hour. It just seems wrong. Seems, feels. What about the people who can't get a job when the minimum wage is 20? Well, we we'll, won't we'll think about them. We're not going to talk about them. We're not going to think about them. You can teach that the minimum wage destroys people's lives and people will still vote for it because it, it, it feels good. And yes, some people need to be sacrificed to make other people feel good. So, you know, the, the, the reality is, the reality is that the debates out there have nothing to do with economics. They have everything to do with morality. And the reality is that we will never be successful in convincing people about laissez-faire economics and laissez-faire uh, laissez uh, laissez world on the basis of economic arguments because they're not interested in them. 
as long as they believe that sacrifice is noble, that sacrifice is good, as long as they believe that uh, you know, being self-interested is evil, is bad, is wrong, being selfish, being greedy, by definition, are evil and wrong and bad. You can't have capitalism. There's no way to get it. There's no way to have it. They'll rationalize, they'll make excuses, they'll come up with economic just-so stories to, you know, pretend that, they are, uh, that they're contradicting your economics. But what motivates it all and what makes their argument persuasive is morality, ethics, morality and ethics. And, you know, other things like making people feel good, which is, you could argue, epistemological. You know, when emotions are primary, who cares about economics? It's all about feel-good policies. It's all about what sounds good. It's all about what the notion is good, right? So, uh, yeah, that's where we are. Unless we fight for egoism, unless we fight for self-interest, unless we fight for everybody's right to live their own life on their own terms uh, without, being, without force being applied to them. And that is true of big businesses and small businesses, of consumers, of producers, of people out there. And remember, every consumer is ultimately a producer. Unless we fight for your rights, your rights, your moral rights, which means your right to live your life in pursuit of your own happiness, in pursuit of your own interests, your own life, your own values, forget about economics. Economics is useless. All right, so economic ignorance comes from bad morality, bad philosophy, bad ideas, a bad epistemology, epistemology that elevates uh, emotion above everything else, and a bad morality that, ele- that, that denounces, more than it elevates anything, it denounces self-interest. The denunciation of self-interest kills capitalism, and it kills economic freedom. It kills rational economic debate.